Good morning. Good morning. Wow, you'd think that it was a snowy, cold, icy day outside, wouldn't you? Wow. Well, we're grateful you're here. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. We continue our series uh, uh, in kind of greater than. Today we're talking about the mission is greater than me. The mission is greater than me. Um, it's going to be weird today, because so usually I say, good morning, head at campus, good morning, Staunton campus, but they're not watching. I mean, they're not in the church service day. So those of you from the head at campus, Staunton campus, who are home, hi, guys. And uh, those of you who are actually here from one of those campuses, hi, guys. And, uh, and good morning to those watching our iCampus. Uh, this is one of those technology Sundays when, you know, you're grateful. I, I have a love-hate relationship with this whole technology thing. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm, a, I'm not as skinny as I once was. And when they watch me on the head of campus and Staunton campus, it actually makes me wider than I actually am. I mean, literally. It, like at the, at the head of campus, we was up there when they was putting that thing in. Uh, so from the top of the thing, like the, 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 the screen, it, uh, from my knees to my top of my head was seven foot. No, eight foot. So I'm like, they're like, that dude is a giant. Anyway, side point. So it's, I'm a big man on those other campuses. So uh, bigger than, I'm bigger than the screen than I am in real life. Um, and, and there's people, you know, they're watching on the internet campus, which is awesome. We love our iCampus. On the other hand, you know, it's like, you know, um, hey, I just want to stay in bed, my bed and my pajamas and watch on TV today. It's like, come on, man, come to church. Anyway, side point, different deal. But anyway, we're grateful for days like this when it makes it easier, especially when it's treacherous outside in some, some of the roads. And, uh, and we're grateful you're here, grateful for those who are watching today. Um, so today's a really important message. Uh, it's a message that in whatever form we talk about, it, we're, we talk about this a lot. We're going to talk about it a lot more. We're ahead in the first of the year. And I don't know if you even understand where, what kind of the transitions we've been on for the last couple of years, but uh, we've been on a transition and a process. And Back two years ago, we didn't have any space. We were, you know, we had no parking, we had no seating, we had no children's areas, we had no space. And and then a year and a half ago, in April, is when we got into our new building, this building in the, at the Carnival campus. Um, and then, you know, we've been on a journey from that perspective to grow and develop and get ourselves back where we ought to be at and the mindset because you know we used to have a mindset of we was always reaching people and growing and then we got ourselves in a position where like, there's no space so we're gonna put anybody at it was just kind of a, it's a mindset and so anyway so we're where we are today and um the day's message is really important we understand that the mission is greater than me when i use the word me and i'll use it a lot today i'm not talking about it's greater than me but you know it's greater than you me also all the me's, the me plurals, right? It's greater than all of us individually or as collective group. It's, it's greater than me. The mission is greater. Greg, what's up, brother? I'm good, man. I didn't know you was coming in. The, Jesus, well, Jesus is more important because that's the whole point of today's message. Jesus is great. He's more important than you. So that's the side point, but different message. I couldn't have, I couldn't have you be an object lesson today even. Have you already lost your wife? Yeah. Yeah. It's a sore subject. That's why. That's <laughs> sorry. Bring that up. That's bad. Sorry about that. Anyway, man, it's always funny. I, okay, I don't. I don't have any diagnoses. <laughs> yeah, diagnoses. Diagnoses. I don't have any diagnoses. <laughs> but I got all kinds of issues. <laughs> I'm just saying. And some things distract me, you know, like the other day, it was Ryan Tosh over here on my left, and there was a, there was a really pretty blonde with him. And if you notice, okay, his wife is really pretty, and she has really short black hair. And this was a really long-haired blonde, and it freaked me out, okay? <laughs> so I, I saw that, and I think, okay, wow, dude. And I walked this way, and there was a dude sitting over here, and he had like a, his arm in a sling. His, I thought, what happened to him? Okay, I'm trying to talk to you why these things happen. So if you ever want to mess with me, if you sit over here, go sit over there. If you sit over there, go mess over here. That would freak me out of my mind, okay? So anyway, it's just hard me and me sometimes. And so when people walk in, I expect like, what are they there for? That's weird. Anyway, so I have to talk about it. Sorry, 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 sorry. All right, this passage, Romans chapter 12, or actually 11, I'm going to pick up. And really, the, it's, one, it's a one-verse 
What I want to talk about is in one verse, but these other things need to apply to it, so I need to get them all in there. Romans chapter 11, verse 29, was a verse that I read, I guess, either in college or right after college, and it, it just freaked me out. It's not because it's a bad verse. Just because of the ramifications of what it says. For the gifts and the call, or God's gifts and his call, are irrevocable. I remember reading that going, irrevocable. I mean, I don't have the biggest vocabulary in the world, but I know what that word means. That the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Now, for time's sake, I won't get in all, I'll read all these words to you, all these, this passage, but the, you know, I, I'm gonna, the message is really going to go through verse chapter 12, verse 8. Um, but that one verse is where we're going to come back to. So he ends chapter 11 talking about how awesome God is and how great God's ways are and you know, all that kind of stuff. And you can never replay God and these kind of things. It's a very uplifting end of chapter 11. Chapter 12, it goes into a passage we're really familiar with probably around here. Chapter, I, I quote verse 2 a lot. But chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, and he's really referring back to what chapter 11 was talking about, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That word living sacrifice in some translations is your reasonable act of worship or your reasonable service. It's like, based on what God has done for you, becoming a living sacrifice to him is your minimum level of, this is what should happen. I'm talking about total surrender, complete surrender. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship or act of worship, act of love. The word worship doesn't mean what we say on Sunday mornings. It's, worship is the extension of love to God. That's what worship te- technically is. Verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In my Bible, I have the word then circled. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. That we always want to skip the mess that stuff up. That's the if-then clause there, where if we choose to let, you know, instead of conforming to the world around us, transform ourselves by how we think, then we'll be able to prove what God's will is. And so many times we skip that. And the problem is there's so many lies out there. So many things that we, you know, we, just, we think these things are true, but they're not. And that's where God has to renew our mind. Different message, I'll keep going. Verse three. For the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance to the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us is one body with many members, saying, you know, my body has different parts, hands, feet, toes, whatever, uh, but do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though we're many, are form one body. Talking about the we are many, but we make one church. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance to your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's encouraging, then encourage. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. Back to verse 29 where it says that God's gifts and calling are irrevocable. That word calling, and when he uses the word grace in verse three, and we talked about gifts in verse uh, four, five, and six and through there, it's the same Greek word, or a form of the same Greek word, charismaton, okay? And when we talk about spiritual gifts, and if you've been here very long, you've heard me talk about those at different times, there are, people get confused about spiritual gifts, how they operate a lot, but there are different lists of gifts, different functionalities of gifts. One of the gifts is, one of the gifts lists called motivational gifts. There's seven of those. And we always tell you that you have one of seven. Most people will not say that because they're just not paying attention to what it says. And, and most, most, uh, most tests you take just give you a test, you know, here's all the different gift lists and, you know, which ones you have and based on how you answer these questions, which is fine. It's not evil. But the point is, according to Scripture, if you read, if you understand what it says, that every time the Greek word charismaton or one of its forms is used, it's singular, 
Never plural. It's always singular when it's talking about the individual's gift. Now, the gift list, when it says there's a gift list of all these, it's plural because there's seven. When it's talking about the individual, when God, you know, when Paul says to, when Paul said to Timothy, fan into flame the gift that was within you, that word gift, talking about the Christmaton gift, was, was singular. It wasn't plural, it was singular. And when Peter talks about it in first in first Peter chapter four, verse ten, Peter's, you know, he talked about the gift that was in you. He said, and say the gifts that are in you, he said the gift is in you, it is singular. It's always singular in the Greek. So that's how we know there's only one, that everybody has one. Now, so it says in verse 29, 11, chapter, chapter 11, verse 29, that the gifts, that God's gifts, talking about, it's plural because he's talking about the list, okay? And his call are irrevocable. The reason call is singular, not plural, is because us as individuals have calls, God's what God's stirring in you, what he wants you to do, but the mission it's very singular. Whatever God has called me to do that's different than you to do, which is different than them to do, which is different than that person over there to do, the mission is singular. We have one mission. I'll get to that in a second. The word gifts refers to the list. There's seven. But the point being is, is that of those seven, every one of us as an individual has one of those gifts. Toward the end of the message, I'll probably get into that just a little bit about how we're supposed to function as a shape. But the point is, God wired us to accomplish the thing that he wants to do. In us individually, in us as a family, in us as a church, in us as the global church. That the gift that God has given you is irrevocable. It doesn't change. That I'm wired the way I am today, I was wired exactly the same way when I was born. And what we call around here our servant profile, the way I was wired. Now, I've learned things. I've adjusted things. I've had experiences. All that kind of stuff is true. But I'm wired exactly the same way. I am the same guy I was at eight. I'm the same guy I was at 28. I'm the same person. The, how God wired me, the way he gifted me, the call he has on me, is irrevocable. The call he has on you, the way he wired you, his gift in you is irrevocable. The mission he has for his church is irrevocable. Number one, the outline, the mission matters to God. The mission matters to God. So whether I use... Uh, uh, in the outline, I'm not going to read these verses to you. I just kind of quote them real fast, but you can, you can look them up later if you want to. Whether I use Matthew 28 as an example and say that the mission of the church is to go ye therefore into all the world, preaching, teaching, baptizing, making disciples. Okay, we can use that one. Or we want to use Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you know, that, that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we will, be, we will be able to be his witnesses in our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, most part of the earth. These are all different ways of saying the exact same thing. You know, last uh, week or two, two go weeks ago, I guess, we talked about for, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that, that the gospel is the power of God to everyone who believes, it is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. I mean, I can just go pick any verse you want to pick. There's all kinds of them out there that says the mission of the church is to be externally focused on taking the gospel to those who are without Christ, not internally focused on making those who are already found comfortable. And what's happened over the generations is that the church, the found, have gotten so comfortable being found that it's about making ourselves more comfortable. What would make us happy? Well, let's, up, let's amp up our customer service to keep those who are already a part of us. You know, I used to, I use the illustration a lot, not a lot recently because I'm old now and no one knows what I'm getting ready to talk about except you other old people. It used to be a TV show called The Love Boat. Okay, how many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? Okay, see? Every year there's more and more of those hands that go in the air. <laughs> this guy is old. Google it. Anyway, well, maybe not, because that may not be a good thing to search. You may not want to find that. Okay. Okay. How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say love boat? Okay, the love boat was a TV show. 
Okay, and so in the love boat is a, is a cruise ship, and there's always you know there's the customers, and they always start out with that is always going to be on that cruise, and the, the passengers would come on, and they had their crew, and they'd make everybody feel welcome, all kind of stuff, you know, and it was all about customer service, customer service, customer service. It was great, and all these kind of things happen. Okay, and then you're you're a passenger, and then you leave. Okay, here's the deal: the church has is in, in many ways the church is, and, and churches felt this too. They, they, it's like we're the love boat and everybody, everybody who comes is the passengers and the, the, the hired staff and the, the key volunteers, they're the crew and their job is to make everybody happy and to keep everybody comfortable and make sure everybody's needs are met. And that has never been the, the biblical mission of the church. That when you walk in the door, when you walk on our, on our property for the first time, we, we want you to feel comfortable and welcome. When you walk in our building for the first time, we, we want to help you find things, right? And there's things we have to do to be better at that, you know, signage and things like that. And we, we want to be better and better and better, more effective at making people who come for the first time feel comfortable. That's all true at all of our campuses. We want to be better at reaching the lost and, and helping people who who don't know Christ, when God is stirring their heart to be able to find him. And, you know, we talked about in the last few weeks, we want to make it hard to go to hell from Coopin County and all those kind of phrases. Okay, great. But once you come, once you engage, once you decide this is the place God wants you to be at, once you, give, once, once you choose to give Jesus your heart, you have to transition from being a customer to being a crew member. That our job is not to make ourselves feel more comfortable. Our job is to recognize the mission. We have a mission. And ever how we want to term it, it, there's no way around it. And I take it, you know, there's a lot of, you know, I don't, I don't, I can't get my head around the world, you know, and I can't get my head around the nation. I can't get my head around, you know, our messed up state or whatever. But I can get my head around my little church and my little county and my little area, my little region of the world. I can get my head around that a little bit. And that's even mind-blowing when you think about 30,000 people who claim no church affiliation of any kind. That's like overwhelming to us, right? But the point is, is that's about as small as we can make it. And that mission that God has entrusted to us, it matters to him. And what happens so many times, I don't mean to be offensive, you know, Sometimes we have church, and we, whoever church has it, you know, people have church, and we walk away because we sang good prayer, or we prayed good prayers, we sang good songs, we had a good message, and we all felt comfortable, and the building was warm that day, and, you know, there was children who did whatever, and, you know, we had nice decorations, or whatever took place, it was all great, yay, it's wonderful, it's a good time to have church. We walk away feeling so happy with that, and I wonder sometimes if the owner of the church is happy. Just because the employees are happy, just because the crew members who are internally focused and the customers who are internally focused are happy, I wonder if the guy who owns the church, I mean, Jesus is the head of the church, not a board or not individual people, right? It's Jesus. It's his church. It's his body. It's his mission. And so just, just, let's, just let's just say that, well, I used to work at a pizza place and I, was a, I, I got up to assistant manager level, and uh, that's kind of a big deal. Anyway, I got up to assistant manager level, and uh, um, every now and then, the owner who lived in my town, there was, like, there, was a, there was several that he owned, but he lived in my town. If he lives in your town, he might just drop in, you know what I'm saying? And every now and then, he'd just drop in. And when he'd just drop in, what we thought was fine, he didn't think it was fine. And, you know, if you ever worked in a restaurant, there's, there's periods of time where it's just dead as a doornail and there's something called rush. He'd come in invariably right after rush, okay? There have been like 75,000 people, it seemed like, walked through the building, right? And there was a salad bar and all. It, if you, it, they're messy. People are messy. And they'd make all these messes. And then if they got the cheese out and they put on their salad, if there was cheese on the, not, not in the bowl, but in the, on the stuff, you know, how the bowl's in there, he'd get upset, he come back in the middle, and we're like, we just got done with Rush. We're trying to catch up. That didn't matter to him. He was the owner. Now, just, you've all worked for people like that, and some of you may be those people. If you're the owner, it's your business, it's your mission. Right? If 
Jesus is the head of the church. And it's his mission. And we walk away feeling really good about ourselves because we sang great songs and prayed great prayers and, and we had a nice message and we shook a lot of hands. How do you think the owner feels when we forgot about the mission? How do you think the owner feels when we haven't reached people or we're so happy that we reach more people than some other else reaches? How do you think the owner feels? Does he look at it and go, wow, you guys reached so many people this year. That is awesome. You're way better than everybody else is. Great. Or does he go, dude, there is 30,000 people who live around you, who claim no church affiliation of any kind, and obviously you don't care. You know, we care. We care a lot. Really? Really? Then why didn't you invite? Why didn't you live a life that was more consistent with what you say you believe? Why didn't you engage in your local church and carry the ball? Why doesn't your giving financially back up what you say is important to you? Why doesn't your attendance to team meetings, why doesn't your engagement in some team or some small group or some thing that helps you connect with the local church so you can, why doesn't the things that you do and the things that you say, why don't they back up that level of importance? See, we always want to picture God as, oh, he's so nice to us. <laughs> he's great. If you read your Bible, Jesus was wonderful. He was so gracious to those who are far from God. The people that Jesus showed his anger toward, his sarcasm toward, his strong verbal comments toward, were people who considered themselves saved by their standards, who were the religious leaders of the day, who were the attenders of the religious organizations of the day. That's who he had the strongest language for. If Jesus came back to earth today to walk, not to take us to be in heaven, but to, to live on among us, who do you think he'd be the strongest toward? Not the people far from him, but the people who claim to be close to him but aren't really following him. Those who claim to love him but aren't surrendered to him. Those who claim to know him but don't trust him. Those who want to be a part of his organization but they don't want to be a part of his mission. Those who choose to be internally focused rather than externally focused. Number two in the outline, the mission is a high stakes war the mission is a high stakes war. So I gave you some scriptures, you know. Um, I can give you others, but um, most of the time we know the mission. We know where to go you there for. We know where to invite people. We know where to share people. Here's something I need you to understand. It's a high stakes war. That you are literally in a war. Now, people use the word literally incorrectly all the time. You know that, right? I am literally going to die. No, you're not. I am literally burning up. I am literally freezing. They use the word literally all the time in incorrect forms. I'm not. You are in a war. I don't know if I really believe that. Read your Bible. Your enemy doesn't want you to believe this is true, but I'm telling you, this is an absolute fact. You are in a war. We as a church family, we're in a war. We're not in a war for the culture. I mean, we say those kind of things, right? We're not in a war to make sure we can say Merry Christmas versus Happy Holidays. And by the way, if you get caught up in that, don't. That's stupid. Okay? That's just the dumbest thing ever. We, we don't get, we're not in a war to be bigger than someone else. That's, those aren't the real issues. But get your head around this, that God's mission, his call is irrevocable. His gifting to you is irrevocable. 
What he wants to do is save mankind. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, right? And he sent us on the same mission, to seek and save the lost. That's what we're supposed to do. The found is supposed to find others. He wants us to create a, you know, we use phrases around here like trying to create a, a, a gospel-soaked cult of redemption or trying to slant the floor toward the cross. All these kind of terms. God wants us to create a place where it's hard to go to hell from where we live at. That's all true. That's great. We can all agree to that. Yay, great. But there is an enemy. The same one that Jesus fought. In Jesus, he came in a physical form even. The devil himself. The demonic hierarchies. Well, that stuff, I, that, I'm telling you, it's true. And he's like when the devil tempted Jesus, he said, after he, he tempted him in chapter four of Luke, and he, he went away because Jesus didn't yield, and he said, he waited till the opportune time to come back. Because there's always an opportune time. And when Jesus went through the whole process of the cross and he died and he resurrected and overcame death and all these kind of phrases and he had victory and all that kind of stuff. Okay, if I can't take away that kind of victory, if I can destroy the local church, if I can render it powerless, if I can get them caught up on numbers rather than being effective, if I can get them caught up in changing out members with one another rather than reaching those who are far from God, if I can make them live though they are saved, but make them live in doubt and live in fear and live without hope, then I can win. If I can help them forget how important it is that what they're doing matters for all of eternity. I've never done a funeral for someone who they wanted to say, yeah, he never went to church, didn't give a rip about God, but he gets to heaven. They all, they all think he goes to heaven. No one wants to think they're going to hell. Nobody wants to own up to we're going to hell. Everybody's always good people getting to go to heaven. <sighs> good people can go to hell. And bad people can go to heaven. Heaven and hell is not based on my goodness or my badness. It's based on a personal relationship with a man named Jesus Christ. He took all my sin. He became my sin. So I could have the righteousness of God that was found in him. Mass murderers who give their life to Jesus will spend eternity in hell, I mean spend eternity in heaven. Wonderful people who gave everything to the poor but failed to have a relationship with Jesus Christ will spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. Our best friends, our family members, without Jesus, will spend eternity separated from God. Now, we don't wanna believe that but you know why we don't want to believe that? Well, for several reasons, probably. But one of the main reasons is many of us have failed in our responsibilities to live and share the good news, the gospel. To live in such a way that we reflect Jesus, his way of doing things. We don't want to own the fact that we didn't invite him to church enough times. We don't own the fact that we were kind of hypocritical in front of them. Matter of fact, I don't mean this ugly. If this falls, I'm not talking to anybody, so I'm just talking out, you know. Sometimes those, their friends who go to church, sometimes are the, they, they won't say to the friends sometimes, but sometimes the friend who goes to church is their reason not to go to church. Like they, okay, so-and-so goes to church and look at them. They're just like me. They talk like me. They act like me. They do what I do. What's the difference? They go to church. I don't go to church. I get to sleep in on Sunday. They go to church. I, keep, I, don't, I don't give any money to it. They give money to it. I don't have to worry about volunteering to it. They volunteer to it. What's the difference in me and them? And the reality is, if you're living a non-transformed life, they have a point. That's not how it's supposed to be. See, the mission it doesn't begin with going to you there for. The, the mission begins with allowing the Spirit of God to indwell you and live in you. That's only how you know you're saved. And live inside of you and then transform you from the inside out. If you're being transformed from the inside out, you, the whole point is you either have to stop it or it's going to flow from you, from the throne of God, in and through you, into the lives of others. And that's the way it's supposed to work. God never said, go do this on yourself. I mean, if you go back to the Acts chapter 1, verse 8 passage, it says, you'll be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He has empowered you for the whole point of being my witnesses in your Jerusalem, the place you live, in Judea and Samaria and all the other parts of the earth. I mean, that's the whole point. So God didn't say, hey, go do this on your own. He didn't even say that to Jesus. 
Jesus did not start his ministry until the Holy Spirit indwelt him. If you know Jesus and the Holy Spirit indwells you, because that's the only way you can be saved, right? If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you can't, okay, he's going to, by his natural sense of purpose, the reason he's there is to transform you from the inside out unless you grieve and quench him. The mission was so important to God that he sent his only son to become sin so he could forgive the world. The mission was so important to God that he raised up his dead son so that through him the world could have life and life that mattered for all of eternity. The mission was so important that he empowered his son with the Holy Spirit to watch him be tortured and beaten, rejected. And then once he died and went into heaven, that he invested that same Holy Spirit into men and women who would choose to follow him as his guarantee there is children, to empower them to be his witnesses, to take his message of hope and reconciliation, of restoration, of light into the darkness around them. Jesus didn't just so love the world he sent Jesus. Or God didn't just so love the world he sent Jesus. God so loved the world he sent you. He sent me. He sent us. We're not gonna be the savior of the world but he has entrusted to us his message of reconciliation. That he's not holding their sin against them, but he's reconciling all mankind back to himself in Christ. And that he's turning people's hearts back toward him. Our job is to reflect him in the darkness. Many of us are those like matches that I have in my counter or my cabinet in my garage have a box of wooden matches. Probably been sitting there for, I don't know, years. They're just as viable as they were day one. They will work just as much as they did day one. I only use them when I need to start a fire outside. And many of us are like a box of matches that are stuck in somebody's closet. We know Jesus. We have the power to light up the darkness around us, and we just don't. The Bible, some other verses. Again, I won't, I'll just kind of quote them to you real fast for time's sake. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6, really it's verse 3 and 4. What it says is that, that, this, that the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus is veiled. They can't see very clearly. And verse 4 says, because the God of this age has blinded the eyes of unbelievers so they can't not see the light of the gospel. Now think about this for a second. The point is, we're in a war. And we think to ourselves, we think, well, why can't they understand this? I mean, the Bible's good, and Jesus is good, and church is good. Why can't, why can't they get these things? It seems so simple to us. <clears throat> the God of this age has blinded the eyes of people who don't believe yet, so they cannot see the light of the gospel. It doesn't make sense. I, I don't know how to describe it to you. Okay, here's the best illustration I've got, probably. I can't think of an exact one for me, but let's just say it's a food that you thought you hated your whole life, but you never tried it. And then you try to go, I love this, right? That's kind of an example. 
I, well, the people have asked you for your whole life, do you want some of this? Nope. 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 And they kept saying, oh, it's really good. You'll like it. No, that's horrible. I just can't imagine that. That's the grossest stuff ever. And then for some reason, your heart changed just a little bit. And you, on an adventurous day, you said, I want to try some of that. And then you tried it and you're like, okay, I kind of like this. This is good. And now you order it. Now you go to a restaurant to have it. Now you make it at your home because now you like that. That's kind of the way it is. It's like people say, well, I don't, I, you know, that, that's not my thing. At church, that's not my thing. There are people in this room who used to say that church is not my thing. Jesus is not my thing. And we just, okay, not your thing. People without Jesus have no idea what it's like with him. And those of you who claim to know him, if you're living like you don't know what it's like to have him, then maybe you don't. Smiley face. The God of this age. I mean, just get your head around this. They don't understand because they can't see. Have you ever talked to somebody like Dan Fleischer sitting over here? Dan, Dan and Bill Ames. That's kind of funny. Bill's over here, Dan's where they kind of balance out the whole building. Okay. And they, they, they do a lot of stuff with their IT stuff, okay? Uh, all of our internet stuff, things like that, right? Okay, they can have a conversation. Okay, I'm not dumb. They can have a conversation between each other, and I don't have any idea what they just talked about. I don't know if they're making it up or not. They're saying, they all know what they're talking about. Yeah, they're nodding. They may be just like walking away laughing, like, we thought we tricked it. I don't know, Okay. Now, just picture that for an example, okay? I can stand and talk to someone about Jesus, about the difference that Christ makes in me. I can be talking to you around your friends or your family, or whoever we're talking about. We can be talking about the, what happens when God transforms your life and what's, what the Holy Spirit's working in you and, and the, the change is taking place in you. I can talk about people just, and they're going, that makes no sense to me. People who go to church don't understand that stuff, which means to me, they don't know it. They haven't experienced it yet. They don't really know him. If you've not experienced transformation, you got to ask yourself why. I mean, either you don't know him or you're grieving and quenching him. Those are your options, biblically speaking. And so just like Dan and Bill can have a conversation that I cannot comprehend. I mean, I hear what they're saying. I understand the words. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. I couldn't repeat that if I had to. I just trust they know what they're talking about. Keep fingers crossed, toes crossed, legs crossed. And I'll never understand what they know without education, experience. But that is not how it's meant to be with Jesus. Once the Spirit of God indwells you, then God begins a journey with you, transforming you from the inside out. You begin a journey of either accepting that or fighting against it. Either receiving or grieving and quenching. There's a spiritual war. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, I think it is, that tells us that the battle's not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. Even we think it's people, because we see people. People are the issue. Well, people are the issue, but they're just pawns in the game. The person who talks about you, the person who hurts your feelings, the person who don't get it, the battle's not with flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. Verse I've used, I guess the last few weeks also, when Paul was talking in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, how he said it was, was that the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who receive it, it's the power of God for salvation. There's another way of saying it, same thing. That if you don't understand it, it makes no sense. It's gibberish. It's like, why would that matter? It does matter. It's a war we're in. All right, I got two pictures I'm going to show you real quickly. Uh, first picture is a classroom picture of a bunch of second graders. Throw that on the screen real fast. Um, looks like a normal class of second graders back in the 40s or whatever that would have been like, right? Um, the person on the far front row, far left, that smiling little boy right there looks so happy. That boy right there is the second grade version of a man named Lee Harvey Oswald. He looked happy, doesn't he? You never looked at that child and thought he would ever, 
ever, ever consider killing him, assassinating a president? Unless you believe in conspiracy theories and then maybe he didn't. Never thought it would happen. Matter of fact, my sister, my, my, my wife's brother's wife, her dad is in that same picture. Her dad was a, was a second grade school. Now think about that. I went to grade school with Lee Harvey Oswald. We played in the playground. He is a happy, smiling young man. Nobody had any idea what his future held. I wonder what would happen if he found Jesus, maybe in seventh grade, or he found Jesus in high school. I wonder what would have been different. Go to the next picture. Next picture is, a, is actually a decision card, and I don't know if you can read it, uh, those in the audience can read it, but it's actually Billy Graham himself. It's his decision card. When he decided to give his life to Christ from 1934, he was, he was 15 years old. He was six days away from his 16th birthday when that took place. He went to church. He didn't really go to church that often. He went to church, though. He was kind of rambunctious. Not, not a bad kid, just a little bit of a troublemaker. Went to church. He thought that the preacher, his, the preacher's name, it was a revival service. He thought the preacher's name was Mordecai Ham. He thought Mordecai Ham was preaching to him, that every Sunday he was talking to him, or every night of the service he was talking to him. And so him and his buddy thought, okay, what to do is we want to get where he can't look at us. And so they went and sat in the choir loft. They couldn't sing. They didn't plan on singing. They didn't try to sing, but they sat in the choir loft because you know, it was packed out. They sat in the choir loft so he would not talk to them. And they still kept thinking he was talking to them. They gave their life to Christ. Now, just for a second, I gave you one example that was bad. I'm giving you another example that's positive. When the 15-year-old, almost 16-year-old version of Billy Graham gave his life to Jesus... Do you think anyone in the room had any idea what God would do through that one person's life? So when you hear me talk about in our campuses, and I, I use the phrase down the hallway because in our, at the Carnival campus we have to have hallways. Um, but in our children's areas, we have no idea what's there. We have no idea what can happen in the local church, what can happen around the world. We have no comprehension of what God can do. But what I'm telling you is we are in a spiritual battle, a high stakes battle that some we're going to lose. And maybe, hopefully, statistically speaking, there'll never be someone who assassinates the president. But maybe there's just someone who lives without hope. Maybe there's someone who tries to console themselves in the end of a bottle or using a drug. Maybe there's someone who just tries to console themselves with one relationship after another relationship after another relationship after another relationship. Maybe there's someone who just, just doesn't do anything wrong. But they just feel empty. They feel like there has to be more. May they just never live with a person who they know accepts them and loves them as they are. On the other hand, maybe there's going to be somebody who God uses to make a difference that lasts for all eternity. We'll never know until it happens. But I'm telling you, we're in a war. That the God of this age is blinding people so they cannot see the light of the gospel. Number three in the outline, the mission of me is always going to undermine the mission of God. The mission of me is always going to undermine the mission of God. What I mean by that is, is just, if you, if, you know, my, and then just make a blank and whatever you want to put in your blank. My time, my money, my comfort level, my resources, my whatever it is, my, pick anything, my emotions, my, pick anything you want to pick. My is always going to undermine the work of God. See, when God wants to do something in you, when he wants to stir you for something that is outside of you, that's bigger than you, is that thing, oh, I don't know if I can do that. What is that? Me feels insecurity. Me feels fear. Me feels doubt. Me has where that thing is, right? So I want to shrink back. Well, if it's comfort zone versus taking risk, 
me wants to be comfortable. So if God's calling me to take a risk, I don't want to do that. Me is undermining the mission of God because the mission of me is to be comfortable. The mission of God is to go ye therefore, beginning in my Jerusalem. If it's, well, I don't want somebody to reject me. Okay, the, the mission of me is don't be rejected. Be a people pleaser, make people like you, whatever the phrase is, right? But the mission of God is love people, reflect me, share the good news. The mission of God is, Tim, invest money in this. Give toward this. I don't know. I can't afford that. I don't want to do that. The mission of me is undermining the mission of God. Because if I want something else, if I want something else, I will find a way to buy it. Right? If the mission of me wants it bad enough, I will get it. The mission of God, somebody else take care of that. I mean, after all, if God wants it done, God can do it himself. And he can but he's not a dysfunctional parent either. He won't enable you. He wants to empower you. Big difference in enabling and empowering. He wants to empower you to carry out the mission he assigned to you. If a parent owns a large company and he has children, he doesn't just say, okay, all my children are gonna be equal in my company. Eventually, there'll be presidents and vice presidents and whatever the, the word is. Because let's just say one just never chose to be a part. All they want to do is spin, spin, spin. All they did is get in trouble. And another one was faithful and diligent and all those other kind of words. And they applied themselves and became good in business and whatever the words are. A parent would would evaluate that stuff, right? So now we want God to be to us all equally in his business, according to his mission. And God doesn't treat us all equally. His love is equal. His forgiveness is equal. All those kind of phrases. His grace, his mercy, all that kind of stuff. But that's where it's going to end at. The list like that's where it's going to end at. Because God's paying attention too. And God's judging my heart, my motives, He's judging my thoughts. He's paying attention to how I choose to respond or not respond to him. My mission is always going to undermine the mission of God. Number four in the outline, the mission of God is always going to be greater than the mission of me or me. The mission of God is always going to be greater than me. As a coach, you always want people to play for something bigger than themselves. It's not about your statistics or your playing time. It's about something bigger than that, right? And, and based on what, you, what the team you have is, you're, you kind of position that conversation so they understand. You know, whether you're playing just for a win or you're playing for your community or you're playing for whatever you're playing for, there's a reason. You know, we're, we want to play for something bigger than ourselves. And that, that happens all the way through. And the same thing is true in non-sports teams, teams like a church, teams like businesses. What's your win? If I'm playing for me, I'm just playing for longevity. I just want to keep a job. Well, to keep a job, what do you do? You don't preach messages like I preach. I offend people. You just keep everybody happy. Just do good customer service. You know, hug necks and hug babies and bury people and marry people and don't rock any boats. The king of me wants to be comfortable. But God's mission is always going to be bigger than me. See, if we choose to play for something bigger than us, whether it's names like 32,000, whether it's whatever that everyone, I, mean, I can do this in a lot of different ways, but for time's sake, I won't get too far into it. But no matter how we want to put that in a position, it, it, how we think about it is, is that God's mission is bigger than me. It's not about being a comfortable church or paying bills. 
It's not about being a certain size or having a certain number of campuses or having a certain, number of, a certain level of technology. That's not what it's about. It's about God's mission to go you there for in all the world. And if somehow miraculously we could reach 30,000 people tomorrow, I mean, if that happened tomorrow, that'd be awesome. But you know what we're going to talk about on Tuesday? There's all kinds of other people. I mean, you just keep going out farther, right? And even of the 30,000, just because they give out to Christ, there's so much brokenness. There's so much, they're just because they're babies in Christ. I mean, they get it all. One of the ways the church fails is we have babies in Christ, but the woes of those who are mature in Christ, we checked out. We're too busy. We, we, got, we ain't got enough time. We're more worried about our vacations. We're more worried about our stuff at home. And we're more worried about our businesses than we are about helping develop the fo- people who just chose to follow Christ. People who are just meeting Jesus need tour guides. They need, they need coaches who will help them develop and grow in their faith. And, and what happens in many churches is some churches don't reach anybody. Some churches reach a lot of people, but we won't disciple anybody. We don't develop anybody in their spiritual development. And we're like, why don't you guys change? Why don't you grow up? Why don't you experience this? Why do you keep falling back in your old ruts? Because those who claim to know Christ the longest aren't leading them out of that. God's mission is always going to be bigger than me. And when the Bible talks about dying to yourself, crucifying yourself, when Jesus, when, you know, the cost of following him, he'd say, deny yourself, follow me, that kind of stuff, right? It, when, when they're talking in that terminology, what they're saying is, it's just a different way of saying it, that the mission that I, Jesus, have for you is much greater than your mission for yourself. You may not understand it in your immaturity or your, your small-mindedness or whatever it is, but I'm telling you, my mission for you is greater than your mission for yourself. And the end of your life, You're going to have spent your life living for yourself. Or you're going to spend your life living for me. The gift that God has given you is irrevocable. The call that he has on your life is irrevocable. The call that he has in this church is irrevocable. And we will stand before him and give an account. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 through 4, something like that, says... That, the, that, that we've been entrusted with the mystery of God and those who have been entrusted must prove faithful. That we will be held account to what God's entrusted to us. I will be held account for what God's entrusted to me. You will be held accountable for what God's entrusted to us, to you. God's not impressed with big church churches. I'm gonna close with a question. I won't finish the answer to the question probably, but I want to close with the question. Can you count the apples on a tree? Picture an apple tree. Can you count the number of apples on a tree? Now the short term answer is yes. You can go up to a tree and you can see an apple on the tree and you could count those apples. But the long range version of that is that every one of those apples has countless seeds. And if I eat an apple and throw it in a trash can, the core of the trash can, those seeds never bear life. But if I take that apple and I use those seeds, each one of those seeds can provide a tree who's filled with other apples. You can see how the, the math goes. Many of us are like an apple and the enemy wants to eat that apple and throw the core of it in the trash. He wants to use distractions, fears, insecurities, busy schedules, our personal mission and kingdom, our being comfortable whatever, to forfeit God's call and gifting in our life. If the apple's purpose was to make an apple tree, multiple apple trees with more apples, if I take it off, I eat it, I throw it away, I have forfeited its purpose. On the other hand, every time an apple 
the seeds of an apple become apple trees that produce more apples. There's really no possible way to count how many apples are contained upon one apple tree. There is no possible way to look at the church and count what God's willing to do in that church, through that church, because of people choosing surrender and trust at that church. We're either seeds that are being planted, and then we become trees who continue to plant, or we're just fruit that's been thrown in the trash can, where the enemy is handicapping forfeiting God's plan for us. The mission of Jesus in and through us. The mission is greater than me. It's greater than you. It's greater than all of us combined. Like I do almost every Sunday, I want to challenge you to give your life to the mission not the mission of a church, but the mission of our Savior. To be a part of the rescue mission. Because he rescued me, how can I not risk everything to rescue others? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. God, thank you that um, through technology, not just people in the room can hear, but people around the area can hear, people around the world can hear. God, I thank you that through your spirit that my simple words can be translated to make sense, to matter. <coughs> God, we don't care about being big. We don't care about being fancy. We don't care about our technology. God, what we care about is you. And seeing your mission being carried out where we live at. God, we're asking you to do things that we never thought possible, that no one thought was possible, for your glory and your purposes. God, as we worship, as we process this message, as we respond to you, some of us may come to have communion, some of us may come to the altar. God, whatever it is that we're using to process with you, we just stand and we, and we just talk to you about it or we just receive from you or we sit. And God, whatever that is, God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that this is not time to check out, but it's a time to engage you receive from you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.